My name is Maggie Riddle, and I am a first year MBA student at Sloan. And it is my pleasure to introduce our next panel, Ticketing Analytics Secondary to None. This mean. panel is part of the business track presented by Ticketmaster. Our panelists today are Rob Sign, Chief Revenue Officer of Axis, Adam Grow, COO of Core Software, Kristen Burnett, uh, Senior SVP of Business Operations at MSG, uh, Patrick Ryan, co founder of Eventelect. This panel will be moderated by Shira Springer, sports and society reporter for WBUR and NPR. This panel will be 45 minutes with 10 minutes at the end for questions. If you have any questions, please tweet them at Ticketing Analytics. And with that, I'll pass it off to Shira. Thank you, Maggie, for that introduction. And thank you all for coming. We have a fantastic panel ahead. We're going to get to some really interesting topics like is the season ticket dead? Should we even be separating primary and secondary markets? And how exactly do you measure fan behavior when it comes to ticketing? But before we get to those topics, I wanted to toss this out to all of the panelists. What do you think are the biggest opportunities in ticketing right now? And how are you trying to take advantage of those opportunities? Rob, we'll start with you. Well, thank you. Good morning. There's two things. One is really changing the mindset in the industry on the full season. It's equivalent from a season ticket standpoint being king, uh, going from units being what's focused on to, what re to revenue, which is what actually keeps the lights on and helps organizations grow and do more in the organization and the community. So that, that's the first thing. And then the second is really continuing to eliminate paper tickets, create more security, convenience, and safety for consumers as they're being able to trust what they buy and knowing that it'll give them the experience they're looking for. Adam? Uh, the personalization of the experience. Um, the clients we work with, the way they're aggregating data, the way they're looking at their consumers, mm -hmm. um, it's not just full season ticket buyers anymore. It's segments of full season ticket buyers. There's the young professional, the families, and how do you tailor the experience for each and every one of those groups and, and how do they kind of consume your product? Mm -hmm. I'd just say, you know, add not just uh, tailoring uh, and personal, personalizing the experience, but personalizing the level of service uh, across the board. You know, we, we created a service model uh, back in the day with the NBA um, uh, that, that decided that we were going to have like a service and retention model, and it was groundbreak, groundbreaking back then. Um, and, and every team ended up doing it and, and created the service model, and then other leagues took it on. Uh, but I think we have an opportunity to reinvent that and, and look at how, how we service our fans and how we segment our fans, uh, not just the full season ticket buyers, but also the quarter share buyers and the half share plans. Um, it's interesting because when you look at the data, uh, if an account holder for a full season ticket holder, they probably go to 30% of the games themselves. With a half season buyer, it goes to about 60%. And for a quarter buyer, that goes to about 80%. So you're, you're kind of servicing the right, this, the same person. It just is they're sharing the tickets, they're reselling the tickets. So kind of treat them the same. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of following up with what Adam and Kristen said is kind of going in reverse order actually is you know, personalizing experience, personalizing service on the front end is personalizing how the customer is buying the ticket. Uh, you know, keep in mind the primary markets, Axis and SeatGeek and Ticketmaster, they, they have a lot of business responsibilities. And so selling the ticket is, is part of it, and they do a very good job of it. But we're going to start seeing a layer come on top of that around personalization. And we think that's going to be powered by, quite frankly, the potentially, you know, AXS and Ticketmaster and those are going to deliver solutions. But we also see potential disruption from the FANG companies, from Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google, none of them except for Google have a real uh, meaningful presence in ticketing today. Uh, and so the data that they have on their users, they're gonna be able to deliver a, you know, a young professional, a ticket option that's in the 35 to $55 range. They're gonna be, to be able to deliver a ticket option to a partner at a law firm in a 200 to $300 range with uh, all-inclusive you know, access. And so we definitely think that personalization in terms of really targeting uh, limited options that, that are more meaningful is something that we're going to see happen, whether it be by the, the primary markets or by uh, you know, those large uh, you know, uh, fang companies, quite frankly. And a lot of all, and all of the stuff that you're talking about is possible, this personalization because of the increased in, in identity-based ticketing. I mean, that seems to be the big thing that's happening in the area of ticketing. And how has that affected the way you do business? Just how has it changed your thinking, your company's thinking, your client's thinking? 
<laughs> well, that's a that's a big piece for Axis. That's the foundation of our, our company is built on is the mobile is the, the the identity. It's not the ticket that you have. It's you and the interactions and the activities that you're engaged with and and the, the steps that you take. So the ticket is just a piece of it. So with that comes more data, comes more responsibility to be able to personalize and provide a better convenience. And then at the same time, it allows that that safe and secure opportunity. So. Knowing you and what your habits and what your likes are, we're able to have a much more targeted conversation with you to deliver exactly what it is you're looking for and cut through a lot of the clutter in the marketplace. But that's, that's really what we have retooled the foundation for our organization over the years to focus on that convenience and personalization. But it's all around the, mobile, the, the, the personal identity and that mobile ID and that being the individual, not necessarily the tickets that he or she may have, the access into the venue, the other opportunities, the things that they can do how you can split that off to give them, again, the more personalized experience. So you go from having a ticket and a club seat experience or a post-event meet and greet and knowing that those are the rights associated with that person because that's what they're looking for. And again, it's based on the mobile identity. So the, the thing for us, and this is a little bit of a sales pitch, but the thing for us is that if you look at our barcode, it's not the ticket, it's the individual and then everything else that comes along with it. So that's how I'd sum it up. That's tremendously important and that, that is the key moving forward to everything that the panel has said so far. Mm -hmm. Now, Kristen, it was interesting to me some of the stats you brought up and I hope I'm recalling them correctly, but the season ticket holder only goes to 40%. 30%. 30% yep. of the games. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, I know in the panel description it said season ticket holders remain the key to sustain success. Mm -hmm. But there are rumors that the season ticket is dead or dying. Um, is the season ticket dead or is its demise imminent? And I'll, I'll throw it out to everybody, yeah. but do you find that the case? Or do you think I wonder if it was ever alive. Really? So it, the notion of somebody buying tickets and going to 41 home games, when you talk about the NBA and the NHL, maybe, maybe in football in the NHL, or in the NFL rather, that, that there's true season ticket holders are there all the time. Um, but people generally buy tickets, you know, businesses buy tickets, and they're true season ticket holders, they're giving it to clients, et cetera. Um, but there's so many fans who have, you know, grabbed their friends and, and bought season tickets over the years, and they, you know, they all they all want to sit in the same seats and they trade tickets. Uh, so you know, that percentage of the season ticket base is is pretty high. Um, so so you know it, it it it's changing, and the more that we get to know our fans, uh, and that's why the identity based mm -hmm. part of ticketing is so important. The more that we get to know them the more that we can actually customize their ticket plan to fit their needs versus trying to get them to you know, team up with their friends and neighbors and whoever, you know, their, their, their coworkers, uh, to buy a season ticket, I think would just provide a better service overall. Mm -hmm. Any other yeah. thoughts? Yeah, Brad. I started selling tickets for the Milwaukee Bucks in 2001. And mm -hmm. when I got into the league, Group ticket sales were a novel concept They were a new idea. And so if you look at the history of selling tickets in professional sports, for example, it's always been born out of necessity, I believe, that somebody has said, okay, we're going to start with single game tickets back in the 50s or 60s. Just walk up to the box office and come out to our sporting event. Well, then they thought, well, we can capture by selling a few more packages, and then maybe we'll create the season ticket. And then the season ticket started to struggle a little bit, so many plans were evolved. And then groups became more and more prominent. When I got in the league, there were four teams in the league focused on group ticket sales. So it shows the importance of the evolution from a model standpoint of how teams and venues have had to recreate what it is that fans are looking for. So. The season ticket, you know, I've said years ago, the season ticket, the label is changing. The experience, this is an on-demand world that we live in now, whether it's you know, ride share or getting food delivered to your, your home, whatever the case might be. So fans are looking more for that experience and less for let's hold on to a certain piece of real estate for 44 games. But teams were also doing that too because they wanted to, they knew there was a syndicate. Like she mentioned, several people that were going in and buying it together to get the greater benefit. So we were forcing the consumers to buy something they didn't really want or they couldn't use all by themselves to get something that they then has turned back into you create this, this army of brokers yeah. uh, that aren't as educated sometimes as you know, some of the other organizations that are out there. So it's, it's, a, it's a challenge for sure. It is a challenge, I would say too, but there, there's a certain amount of pride in being a season ticket holder. Mm -hmm. You hear that from our fans. Uh, that, oh, I'm a season ticket holder with the Knicks or with the Rangers, and, and there's a sense of pride that goes along with it. So I don't want to underestimate the, the, the importance of, of a season ticket and, and what it means to a family. Uh, but, you know, Rob hit the nail on the head. There's, there's plenty of fans who are just buying our tickets and reselling them.
there, there's a real human element. Uh, our organization works with 70 professional sports teams across the five major leagues, and you know, I think that we're going to start seeing a transformation from you know ticket sales reps to more of a, a ticket concierge, where they're you know educating their fans about how to better use the products, better use the the assets and benefits that come with those season ticket packages. Because to that point, um, that connectivity is is most you know ingrained as a quote unquote season ticket holder. So you don't want to rip that bandaid off. It's just like people trying to go away from the concept of a sellout. A sellout is a, still a very marketable and powerful term. So like we shouldn't walk away from that. We shouldn't walk away from the connection of being a season ticket holder. It's a matter of training the staff to really engage uh, with those customers. And that comes down from the usher level. You know, I think that's like a real powerful piece of data. We were having lunch, uh, one of the guys on my team and someone from the NHL, and it's like, why don't we talk to the ushers more? They're the ones that actually see and talk to the customers the most. I think so we're going to start seeing personalization on like the technology front, but I think we need to take a look at personalization on the human touch uh, front as well. If you walk into every event, every professional sports organization, and I know Adam sees this a lot too, each one calls season ticket holders something different. Are they season members? Is it a membership program? Is it a year-round way to engage? So I'm a Seahawks season ticket holder in Seattle, and I live in LA. But I have great pride, to Patrick's point, that I'm a member of the 12s, that, I, that I'm a part of that. I go to three games a year. I sell the rest of them or use them for family or friends. So that passion is important. I, you see teams now transition that into membership or some other label that helps fans still feel that connection perhaps with a different type of package. I know you see that quite a yeah, bit. Yeah, I mean, we get it from our customers all the time. They're, they're thinking about how they can package it better. I mean, 44 games is a lot of games to go to every year. Um, so it, I think you mentioned the revenue piece. It's about revenue, not about the number of tickets, right? So how do we take that $60,000 investment and yeah. allow them the flexibility and convenience that we're getting used to in everyday life, right? So instead of coming in four uh, tickets to row five every game, it's I got a suite one night with um, my colleagues, I bring in my family another night. And allowing that flexibility and convenience that we're all becoming so used to in this world um, to be part of that. I know you also work with teams like the Orlando Magic, for sure. example, and they're thinking about a, more of a season ticket experience. So one, could you Describe a little bit about of, of the Orlando Magic's thinking when it comes to season tickets and the season ticket experience or what they're looking for, and also what data are you using to figure out what fans want now? Yeah, I mean, like the Magic are a great case. They're one of the first people to kind of do the exchange program and magic money or, or whatnot. Um, and it came up at a cab meeting. We have a customer advisory board uh, where we meet with customers every six months. And Jay from the Magic brought this up. And, and they want to get more flexible, right? So using tools like magic money, but even taking that a step further, right? So it's not just about exchanging for tickets or assets, but experiences. Um, travel with the team to a game, those types of things. Uh, what data people are looking at? Obviously, the ticketing data, but getting more into like the demographic data, um, the behavioral data, pulling in those data sources, surveying. I still think the number one um, data aggregator at a team is your fan relations reps, right? Mm -hmm. They're sitting there, they're on the phone, they're meeting people every day, capturing that information, putting that in, and then starting to draw insights out of it. Um, the surveying that goes on, all those different pieces all bring that story together and tell that story. Mm -hmm. Patrick, I'm curious, we talked a little bit about this. Um, how do you think? Pricing needs to evolve. Well, you know, pricing definitely has to, you know, take a different shape if we're going to really have personalized engines uh, delivering options directly to consumers. Uh, when you talk about pricing, like some people might say it's a science and an art. Uh, I think of it more as a science and a gut feeling, right? So from a scientific standpoint, you can run regression models and you can do a lot of different analysis that you could say, hey, this venue has 18,000 different seats you could argue that there's 18,000 different prices, right? So that's like a scientific view. But what our gut is telling us today is that we've overcomplicated this. You know, we need to make this simple again because consumers are making very fast, real-time decisions about everything else they're buying. And we're putting in front of them a choice such as uh, row seven in the upper deck at $35 versus row 10 at $30. That might be the logical segmentation, but it's very confusing. And so when you, when you make a confusing option to a customer, you're putting them in a decision tree. And when you put someone in a tree, they might fall out of it. They might break their <laughs> leg. And then they might not buy anything. So we really are working to simplify our approach to how we're merchandising tickets and how we're pricing tickets so that we can make it faster and increase conversion rates. 
get the sales data, because uh, if you don't sell the ticket, you get no data, you get no customer. So let's try to accelerate the sales process. Look, let's give the row seven at 30, right? Like, what's the crime in that? So let's focus on accelerating the buying pattern, giving clear deals uh, and, and getting them to buy sooner to get the data flow so that you can start servicing them not an hour before tip, but you can service them a week before tip. So that's, that's something our company is getting very focused on. I think it's interesting. We talk about fans as sort of this homogeneous group in some ways. Um, but Kristen, you deal with MSG and you deal with both Rangers fans and Knicks fans. So I'm curious, how different um, are those two groups and how do your strategies differ for those two groups? They really couldn't be more different. Uh, we, we have very different fan bases coming into our building. We, I'm on, uh, tonight is night eight of nine games in a row, Knicks, Rangers, Knicks, Rangers. So every night, you know, you come to the garden, um, you're going to see, a, you're gonna see a, a different type of fan base. Um, and even further, when you, you, even for a Knicks game, you go to a Knicks game, you have the, you know, diehard Knicks fans, and you have, you know, somebody who, and we keep this in mind as we're thinking about how we produce a game um, and the overall experience, you know, we have the benefit and the privilege of, of playing at Madison Square Garden. And for many people, that's a bucket list item. So as much as we pay attention to you know, our season ticket members and, and plan holders, we got to think about, you know, I grew up in Cleveland, and we went to one Indians game and one Cavs game a year, and that was it. And so I always, and my staff always, has that in mind as we're thinking about that customer experience, that that may be the one game uh, that they can be coming to that, that year, and it's, and it's their team, and they can only go one time. And then we have tourists. So, you know, we have, a, you know, that speak different languages. And, and this is like going to a, a Knicks or a Rangers game at the Garden. It's a big part of a big investment for them, um, you know, coming to New York. So the different consumers that we have during, at the games themselves, we, we always have to keep that in mind. And then, you know, the Knicks versus Rangers consumer, the, the, I'll tell you, like, the, the hockey fan base is so passionate. Uh, and they know the game up and down. So, you know, we're looking at, you know, our, our sales reps even. So we have sales reps selling Knicks and selling Rangers. And on the basketball end, you know, you can get away with, you know, talking to fans and just kind of talking about basketball. Hockey, like, if you don't know what Corgi is, forget it. Like, they don't even want to talk to you. Uh, you know, they are diehard hockey fans. So, you know, for us, too, it's, it's not just understanding those fan bases, but also our staff has to speak two different languages. Uh, which can be a challenge, but also a great opportunity for, for them to learn. And some differences in how they feel about uh, mobile and hard tickets? Maybe? Oh, for sure, for sure. <laughs> like, you know, we're, we're constantly thinking about that too. You know, the, the Rangers fan base, uh, they, they definitely want hard tickets. Like, this is, um, you know, something that, that you know, we've, we've thought about and, and maybe moving toward more mobile, but, uh, you know, we're, we're de we definitely have an a, a older fan base on the Rangers side, a younger fan base on the Knicks side. So, um, you know, paying attention to those differences in their, in their comfort level, um, something we, we, we think about. Adam, you looked like you had something you wanted to add. No, I was just actually thinking, when I, get, I get to go to the Garden a lot. <laughs> you're you're um, two so blocks away, right? I was actually reflecting right? on my yeah. experience there at the Jazz game on Wednesday night. And... Uh, I don't know what it says about me, but the bartender knows my name at this point. Uh, <laughs> at the area we go to, because um, we do a lot of business Great. with these guys. Yeah. It's in the Mad yeah. Pub. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's, it's, Harry is his name, so I know his name too. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, every time I go there, whether it's an Acres or Rangers game, that experience happens, right? Yep. He's talking about the Rangers, you know, potentially making the playoffs this year. Um, when I'm at a Knicks game, he's not talking wood. about that. Talk about yeah. that right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that experience happens, and every time you go, um, you know, it just becomes part of that experience. And, and when we bring clients with us, or I bring friends, or whatever, they're always amazed at, at that piece, right? Yeah. And, and that's part of it. So. That's that's part of it. I mean, you have to the, the people who are coming all the time. You have to know them, and the people that you don't know, you have to make it an incredible experience for them. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit to ticket safety. I think if we're going to talk about the evolution of ticketing, we also have to discuss how safety factors in. I know that Ticketmaster has Ticketmaster presence and safe ticks, and it's you know it's the tap and go and 15 bar barcodes that uh, switch over every 15 seconds. Um, but I understand that Axis uh, actually was doing this type of uh, safeguarding before Ticketmaster and. Uh, 
Rob? Well, everybody's staring at me, yes. Yeah, I was going to say, Rob, <laughs> t tell us what, what, what Access has done and sort of also maybe the next iteration of safety measures. Yeah, so Access has been doing through several versions of our company, with, you know, with Veritix and Vertical Alliance, but with the Cleveland Cavaliers and Houston Rockets, we've been doing mobile barcode tickets and mobile tickets for over a decade. So this isn't just something that popped up overnight. Uh, and, it, and it's a continued evolution. It's a process of teaching consumers and customers the, the benefits of switching to mobile only. And we have many stories of organizations that have gone through the four preseason games on an NBA side with letting fans choose between the two. And then game one of the regular season, it's all digital. And there's a little bit of a learning curve. But we, you know, fans are smarter than we give them credit for sometimes. And so the idea is to, to give them these opportunities to grow into a new solution or a new system. But, but for us, it's been, it's been the foundation, again, of our business, and we've seen great success. And again, the Cavs and the Rockets are two examples of early, early adopters, much earlier than the last year or two. They've been doing it for over a decade. The interesting part of it is what's next. And so you think about the ticket um, or the barcode, and we talked about the, the difference between the barcode that Axis uses and it not being a ticket, it's, more, it's the individual. But the idea is that you do have a separate uh, event that pops up for every single one of them. Well, as you look moving forward, I think about, as I go to catch a flight here in a little bit, I have a boarding pass in my Apple wallet. And it, I have to get a new one for every flight that I have. And if you forget to uh, delete them afterwards, you need to go back in there and you find them. Well, the idea is how do you not have unused or all these tickets in your, in your Apple wallet, uh, for example. So the idea is how do you create this omnipresent ID that will stay in the wallet, that will populate with every event because it knows you, will populate with every event that you have coming up. And you never again have to go into another app or anything else to check on. It, it knows what rights you have. You walk up, tap and go. And the great part is you tap once. And if you've got four people with you, all four walk in. You don't have to scan every single. There are no barcodes to scan. You don't have to go through that, which gets people into the venue faster, which helps with F&B and merchandise and experiential stuff. So the idea is getting people in the venue faster, making it more convenient for them. They don't have to search and find their tickets. But then also, at the end of the day, providing tremendous data back to the organization so they can continue to personalize their approach. Mm -hmm. Another thing I'm curious about when it comes to sort of protecting the fan in some ways is privacy. Mm -hmm. um, you have these identity-based tickets. Uh, gives organizations a lot of access to a lot of personal information. So I'm um, curious, first of all, Adam, from, from a team perspective, from your clients, I mean, is there talk in the conversations you have with your clients about privacy? Do they have concerns? Are they trying to negotiate this new privacy landscape? Yeah, I mean, in the U.S., it's still relatively new, right, with the California uh, Consumer Act coming up here. Um, we work with teams in Europe, uh, and so they're a little bit ahead of the curve. Uh, but really, it's, it's educating them and helping them understand, like, as a processor and a controller, like, what the differences are and what you can and can't do. Um, but here in the U.S. right now, people are still just trying to figure it out. And, and how does that data come into the data ecosystem? How does it go out? How are fans opting in, opting out? Um, and a lot of people are just trying to figure that out right now. And, we know, and from our side, um, you look at the generation of people that are really predominantly starting to buy, buy tickets, and Gen Z is becoming the biggest purchasing group out there right now, they know that you're taking their data. They know that you're getting their location. They're willing to give you all that as long as you deliver something back to them that's relevant. As soon as you waste their time, they're out. Well, I, th I think what's interesting is the next generation is that, you know, 15 and 16 year olds, they don't think it's magic when they get an ad on Instagram from something they Googled on their desktop. <laughs> I'm still freaked out by it. Like, who's listening to what I'm talking about? But this next generation, as long as that ad is relevant, mm -hmm. they're really not gonna have a problem with it. Yep. And from a team perspective? We actually hear the opposite. They want us to know them more. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we hear from our fans that, you know, hey, your usher didn't know me when I was coming in and I couldn't get my ID, my ticket out, and that upsets them. Uh, you know, we hear more complaints about how do I get through our, your, your concession line, fa line faster? How do you get through your merchandise line faster? So mm -hmm. the real way to do that is actually through identity-based right mobile solutions um, and making it as easy as possible, whether that's you know, using their phone or, or another uh, way of making it easier to get, to get more customers through lines and, and make it easier to know who they are. So we, we kind of hear the opposite, and I, and I agree. It's just a matter of how you use that data 
um, that's going to make the difference in, in customers pushing back or not. Well, well, think about the power of this. Is uh, There was a survey done by LA Dodgers, premium seat season ticket holders, and a lot of them said the biggest benefit was the person checking them in at the premium station knowing their name mm -hmm. and how that impressed the clients they were with. Well, a Axis and the Cavaliers have a, have a system where they can actually send signals to their service staff when someone scans in. So imagine like sitting at the podium of the premium check-in and you say, oh, so-and-so just scanned in at gate seven. They'll approximately be there in three minutes and you can have a hot dog or their favorite cocktail waiting for them. You know, so we're talking about personalization on a digital level, but that's personalization in a human level, and that gets really sticky, and the cancellation becomes that much harder when the renewal comes up. Yeah, the Cavaliers are really leading the charge for that with, with our portfolio clients. You know, Michael Connolly, who I think is in the audience, gave a, a talk yesterday about all of the tools and the solutions they're using. And one of the ones that I think is the coolest is part of the renovations of Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse is what they call a power portal. And, and you scan in if you come in a certain entrance, and you walk in, and it's all it's this huge digital it reminds me of being in an aquarium and having a shark swim over your head. But they're able to send the uh, season member's name and information to the portal. So you walk through, it says, welcome, Rob Sign, to Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse. That's a really cool moment that happens in a span of 15 or 20 seconds because it's digital and because they have the data. And you take a picture of it and you put it on Instagram. Yep. Uh, and then all of a sudden people are like, I want that experience, that's cool. Uh, and eventually what will happen is someone will be able to press a button on Instagram and then buy a ticket yeah. to the next game. Adam, did you have something? You, okay. Actually, you, you, were, you were just agreeing with everyone. <laughs> you were agreeing with everyone. He's the pipes of a lot of this. So, <laughs> yes, he is. You know, yes, so he, he is. He's, he's observing so they can make their next you know, technology <laughs> improvement to make all this that much better. Just taking it all in. Um, and also, again, with the fan protection theme here, um, recent House committee hearings about price disclosures. Um, there seems to be a consensus that fans should know upfront all of the fees associated with a ticket. Uh, how do you think that new government regulations will impact um, the future of ticket sales and, quite frankly, the future of fan behavior? Adam, you have something to say? Yeah, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> Again, everybody's looking yeah, at me. Yeah. Yeah, well, so you, you, well, your CEO yeah. was yeah. was in front of the House yeah. Committee. Go ahead, Patrick. Well, I was just going to say that. I mean, you know, it's going to make the prices look a lot more expensive, mm -hmm. uh, and so. Uh, I think we'll have like a bit of friction where there might be some you know slowdown of purchases, but ultimately the marketplaces are going to have to react. And um, you know there are oftentimes between the seller and the buyer, sometimes there's a 40% spread, uh, you know, of, of fee margin and fee arbitrage, and like this will accelerate that coming down uh, and really just force more competition in that space. So ultimately, that'll be good for rights holders such as Kristen because. You know, if someone's buying a hundred dollar ticket and after fees it's one thirty, well, there's competition that brings it down to one ten. You know, hypothetically, those twenty dollars are is incremental dollars that her customer has to spend in the building. So it'll be a good thing, but it will be disruptive uh, when it happens for the first, you know, three to nine months of implementation. And, and our organization, and, and we're owned by AEG, are supportive of transparent pricing solutions. And the other thing that's very important to us is making sure that authentic websites are out there that, that have accurate listings, so spec sales. So the idea of selling a ticket, thinking you're going to have it, and then have to go back um, and deliver it never was that more apparent than, I think, five years ago at the Super Bowl in Phoenix with the Seahawks and the Patriots, where uh, brokers had a great year the year before in New York and went ahead and took a lot of reservations for season or for uh, tickets to the Super Bowl and then did not have the inventory and so it exploded with having to have problems and customers being let down. So we are supportive of the of the transparent pricing, which again to Patrick Ryan will be a, will be a process, and then also making sure that there are the right websites out there and, and you know because Google is the number one sales channel that's out there right now for anybody. You go in there and and. Yep. No telling what we talked about. Someone can make up Madison Square Garden, MSG, boxoffice.com, and it's not associated with her at all, but it might look like it. So making sure that fans feel they're going to the trusted, authentic sites and making sure that the brands are form, form, out in the forefront of they're the identity. They're the ones you know you can go to you know, the Garden or you can go to the Knicks or the Rangers, and that is safe, and that gives you an opportunity. And it also allows them to show both you know, primary and resale, if you're going to use those labels, tickets in one location in a commingle marketplace, and again, raising the comfort level for fans they buy that. 
we actually Google Analytics is one of our number one integrated data sources right now. Like every team we work with, uh, with our data warehouse product is asking for the Google Analytics feed uh, because we're starting to map actually the fan journey to that purchase yeah. and that ticket that they got and understanding the different avenues that they came from. So better understanding and tailoring that journey. Is, well, is uh, you know, in, in terms of making things simpler, I mean, to Rob's point, the, the spec, you know, fake listings are just that much more confusing because we talk about the confusing different pricing levels. That's one thing. But then you'll pull up a ticket and say, this one's getting delivered four days before the event. This one's available now. This one's available an hour before the event. I mean, all that stuff's got to go away, you know, just to make things simpler uh, for the consumer that it's instant or it's or everything's getting delivered at a consistent time. The pricing is logical. Row 13 isn't cheaper than row seven. You know, we've got to clean all this stuff up because that's the biggest threat in entertainment is that if you go to Disneyland or you go to Top Golf uh, or you go to a bar and you're buying a bucket of beers, there's not all this variance. Uh, so we've got to start working on uh, simplifying things. So spec listings and all in pricing is like low hanging fruit to just start cleaning this up, make it simpler for the consumer and uh, ultimately increase conversions. From the team I, perspective. I mean, just from a, from a property standpoint, the more transparency, the better. Um, you know, it's interesting to hear people talk about their customers when they're in the secondary marketplace. Um, they're our fans. Uh, they're the ones coming to our, our venues. And when, they're, when they have a bad experience, um, they're not upset about at the, at the website that they're buying from. They're, they're upset with us. Right. And so, you know, we're the ones dealing with all the problems that are created uh, when, when customers feel like they didn't have a, a great experience. We're the ones dealing with when they come up to use their ticket and it's a fraudulent ticket. Um, and that may be their only trip to Madison Square Garden this year that, that I talked about. Uh, we're dealing with that disappointment. We're dealing with you know, those fans who are so excited to come to the game and, and then end up having an issue. So for us, you know, getting rid of the players who, who don't play by the rules and don't play the right way uh, we're, we're very much in favor of that. You know, you, one of the questions you mentioned was like, is there real, really a difference between the secondary and primary? Uh, you know, I think if you ask someone 15 years ago, hey, you know, StubHub's that scalper site. If you ask a 25-year-old consumer today about, hey, what's StubHub or SeatGeek, they wouldn't say that's a scalper or resale site. They say like, that's the site I get tickets on or the Access app or the Ticketmaster app. That's where I get my tickets. They're not really differentiating between a resale or primary ticket. Access does a great job for Houston Rockets games of having both options uh, present for the fan. So us, where we live in the space of helping teams, you know, manage risk and, and distribute and, and pricing, um, you know, we're really taking a unified approach, right? We want to make sure that uh, wherever the consumer shopping, they have a consistent experience, both in terms of pricing, delivery, uh, and that it's in line with the team's brand expectations um, so that we don't have that friction uh, or, you know, that incongruity that can really add to someone's, uh, you know, displeasure with an event. Uh, so that's where we're focusing a lot of our technology is making sure that we're taking a broad view and unifying how we're viewing the experience and pricing uh, and what's available. Yeah, no, the access, I was going to say the Access uh, CEO, Brian Perez, has said that basically you don't have secondary and primary yep. anymore. You just have shops. What are those shops and, and, and how is that going to, you know, sh playing off of what Patrick said, shape the, the marketplace in the future? So what we have found through a lot of insights looking at all of our customers around the world is that fans that come to buy tickets are predisposed. I'm an upper level buyer, I'm a corner buyer, I'm a lower buyer. I, want, I will pay whatever it takes to get the best seat possible buyer. There's, so there's all sorts of different labels you can put on who the, who the fans are and what they're coming to look for. So the idea is to deliver to, to them the information that they want and the ticket options that they want. The, the thing that we look at, too, is that we have a, a program called Access Anywhere, and it's, the idea is to do, take distribution and take the same ticket so we can break it down by the seat level and take the same ticket and put it in different places. So from a shop standpoint, you may go to Groupon, and Groupon has taught you over the years you can get a discount on dry cleaning, on the Chinese restaurant down the street, and also perhaps on an event ticket. And so you're predisposed to think about that perhaps being the discounting site. Um, at, I know they have other solutions, too, but that could be that. You may want to go to Facebook, and Facebook is doing a group uh, where fans are talking about the team or talking about the venue or the artist, and the idea is how do you get them to sit together and be able to create a group or a, a package that includes a t-shirt, for example. So Facebook might have the same seat, but a different experience. So that, when you talk about shops, you're talking about delivering, fishing where the fish are, basically, and delivering to each consumer group uh, what it is that they find the most appealing based on where they spend their, their time. So we talk a lot about marketing and the idea of trying to change consumer behavior and drive somebody back to 
your website or something else, uh, some other website, is challenging and tricky. You, you, know, you spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on radio and television yep. and billboard and print and online media. Instead, or as well, look at if people are always on social media, if people always are, are go to, go to um, you know, StubHub or if they go to Vivid or Game Time, whatever the case might be, put offers and put opportunities there in front of them that are based on what it is they like, again, going back to the data. So those, these shops are created by where people spend their time right now, and you deliver back to them what they're used to buying, again, going back to the Groupon suggestion. I think one of the interesting things you bring up is sort of changing fan behavior is tricky. Mm -hmm. And I want to take a step back from that and ask, how about measuring fan behavior? Because I know there are organizations like the Chicago Bulls that employ a, a behavioral scientist, a behavioral econ economist. And I'm wondering, what are you doing? Adam, for example, what are, what are you doing to try to measure fan behavior, particularly around fan intent when it comes to purchasing tickets? Yeah, I mean, the Bulls are a client of ours. So we work with Kevin and, and Matt and all those guys over there. Um, it goes back to what I said earlier. It's how much data do you have access to and how are you leveraging that data? I think five years ago, it was a success if you could get all the data in one place, but now it's getting that data together, automated, um, and, and pushing out models and measuring it um, so that when you do go back and you're building your pricing and your packaging, uh, it's much more targeted to those people, right? And, and so the more data you have and those more pieces of um, knowledge you have around each person, the more tailored that experience can become. Because we're the back end, right? Like you guys are talking about front end shops and all mm -hmm. that. We're taking the data back in and working with the teams to better understand that data, um, deploy it into their sales staffs, uh, or push it back out into pricing packages in the digital channels. So. How about you, Patrick, with, with regard to fan behavior and fan intent in particular? I mean, intent data right now is a complete mess. I mean, it's a complete mess for a number of reasons because there might be a concert going on sale and you literally have hundreds of thousands of bot hits that are giving some data, but it's not really fan data, right? So, like, that's a level of bad intent data. Another level of bad intent data is you might have someone who checks uh, a marketplace three times a day to see if prices are lowering. Um, that's also kind of muddied intent data. So when we think about, you know, really kind of getting the customer into a better ecosystem, when you get them, you know, using an app where you're delivering the best option at the best price the first time, that's when the data becomes really rich. And so I think that we're moving towards that ecosystem, whether it be within the Teams app or the Marketplaces app, we've really got to make sure that we're super servicing customers uh, where they are looking so that we're actually getting better data about hey, look, this person does usually buy uh, a ticket when the Bulls play the Knicks, and they usually buy a ticket when the Blackhawks, you know, play the Knicks. So next year, when, those schedule, when that schedule comes up, why don't we just tell them when the Bulls are coming to play the Knicks? Uh, and, and I think that that's, that's definitely happening. And then when they don't take that offer, then you can maybe in a week later say, hey, we're kind of surprised you didn't buy. Here's a different offer. Uh, and that's going to unfold in time. But that's really where intent data gets really clean uh, and then very powerful. Switching gears again, Kristen, we've talked a little bit about this, which is you, you have the secondary market. It's mm -hmm. not creating demand. It's capturing it. And it's also not reinvesting in the game yeah. the way that you do. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, one, how you feel about that, <laughs> that you have people out there on the secondary market not reinvesting in the game. And, and also, should they? And if they should, how would you propose they do that? You know, it, it's interesting uh, to think about because you know we're talking about you know consumers uh, in, in how they how they think and how what what they think about and especially you know Gen Z and, and you know Gen Z cares about uh, what brands do in the community. Gen Z cares about you know giving back. Um, and it's interesting nobody really talks about and I think consumers need to get more educated about where they're buying from. You know, they they. The secondary market is investing a ton in in search and in Google, and they're just trying to you know get your eyes first. And if consumers become more educated and they realize that these companies are just investing in technology to make buying easier for them, um, and we're you know doing the same thing, but we're also investing in growing the game of hockey and growing the game of basketball and putting the best products on the court that we possibly can, and investing back in our communities. Uh, in, in, in doing good in the community as much as we can and being good community citizens. Um, the more that our consumers are educated, maybe they'll start to make more educated decisions about who they're buying from and knowing that when they're buying from us, 
we're putting investments back in the community and by in, in our team. Um, and you know, everybody else, where, where are they investing well, other than their pocket? The, the good news is, is that arbitrage is, is starting to get limited from a couple different ways. You know, some of our partners, when they're relying on us to, to take risk in their inventory, and manage that inventory, you know, we are leveraging all the Google channels and they're able to think about their Google spend in a much different way because we're covering all those channels that are capturing the demand. They can reinvest advertising in channels that are exclusive to them, like adding Instagram users, adding Facebook users. So that's starting to flatten uh, to a certain degree. And then likewise with the NFL ticketing solution where you've got marketplaces you know, opted in to becoming authentic websites, they are giving the data and fee revenue back to uh, the, the content rights holders. And likewise, you know, 90% of our firm's relationships, we're sharing back uh, a significant portion of uh, the upside on the risk deals we take with the content. So it's, it is starting to contract a little bit and then that'll enable the teams to more robustly invest in the fan experience. So it's, it's getting there, but to, to Kristen's point, it is, still, it is still extreme in some yeah, cases and I it's mean, gotta come down. It, it has to, you know, we, we you know, for us, uh, you know, investing in the fan experience and, and we wouldn't have to be computing like this on Google and other places um, if this secondary market wasn't allowed to, to, to sprawl the way that it has. Um, so, you know, kind of getting control of our, of our content again and getting control of our, of our consumers is incredibly important. Getting to know them better, getting to know who else is coming into the arena with them. Um, you know, our, our biggest investment that we can make is in, is in our fans, is in our communities, is in our, in our players, and our teams, and we're con con gonna continue to be committed to that. Um, and I think it's upon our, our, our fans and our consumers to, to buy into that proposition and support us in that. Now, Adam, I know some of the members of the audience here might be interested in going into ticketing. So I am curious how technology has uh, basically shaken up organizations, ticketing departments. Uh, yeah, I mean, as teams are becoming smarter and growing their analytics groups and, and practices, I think you're seeing a consolidation. Um, the traditional model of having 60 sales reps kind of calling everybody in the city is, is being reevaluated. I, I haven't seen it completely change yet, but it's being reevaluated. Uh, teams are going to slimmer sales staffs that are, as they have more data points, they're more targeted in their messaging and who they're calling. Um, you know, when I was at the Jazz, a lot of it was just kind of put everything onto Goldmine at the time uh, and just kind of grab the data and, and you didn't know who was calling who. And now it's more of serving those leads into the sales reps. Um, so they're becoming more efficient, they're becoming smarter. Uh, the message is different uh, depending on who you're calling and what they bought previously and what we know about them. And so for those people in the audience that are looking to go into ticketing, there might not be as many jobs. Um, so you're at the right conference to like yep. learn data, learn analytics because those groups are gonna be driving a lot of that piece of um, the sales operations. Mm -hmm. and now Rob, I'm wondering from your perspective, what you know, is the ticket company's responsibility to help deliver to teams and to venues um, technology solutions to do a lot of what we've been talking about today? So having had the chance to work on the team side of the NBA or you know, work in college athletics or all around North America, I've seen every ticketing company that's out there. And what I always said was you picked the best of the worst ticketing company to be your partner uh, based on a check or content guarantee or they had the shiniest objects that made the most sense to you or your neighbor you know, team in town was using them. The challenge was their deficiencies dictated to you your business practices. So that one can't do full season or can't do mini plans, so guess what? You're not selling mini plans or they have to go out and find a third party a bolt on solution to be able to accomplish that goal. One of the things that attracted me to Axis was the idea that we deliver the innovation and technology to allow an organization to run their business as they see fit. And that was key for me. It's, we'll give you the tools. You don't wanna, you, you know, we talk to music venues all the time. Music venues are very uh, timid about wading into resale. They hate it because they feel like the, the fans are being robbed and, and artists are being robbed and all that but they know that they're leaving a lot of money on the table and a lot of opportunity, a lot of data. And so we talk to them about solutions that we have to help with that when the time is right for them to engage in that process and want to do it. But it's incumbent upon us to A, deliver the solutions, B, the insights throughout the industry worldwide. There's great things that are happening in Europe that you can bring back to the states and vice versa, but then also be that, that consultant to them to help them understand how to build the roadmap out. I mentioned earlier that Timberwolves and the, and the Rockets going all mobile. 
the idea has been uh, how do you take that, how do you learn from the Cavs, and how do you go out and talk to other organizations and go, look, here is the, here's the roadmap, here's the plan. Because that safety, that, that security, that helps the individual on the team side feel confident when they make decisions. So again, it's about delivering the technology that allows them to run their business as they see fit, uh, maybe pushing them sometimes and helping them see solutions and delivering insights from other like-minded organizations that are out there, but being there by their side and giving them a seat at the table to, for them to come to us and say, you know, we'd like to do something different. Can we get on the, the dev roadmap that is always talked about? Can we, can we work on this solution? And it's, it's, it's easy sometimes, and sometimes it's not, but giving them the seat at the table to be able to have that conversation to curate and customize their business the way that their vision entails is tremendously important and, and what I really believed in when I joined this organization, but I feel like it's really incumbent upon the industry as a whole to deliver that, because I've always considered myself a rights holder, um, and now I work for a ticketing company, and so I, I understand what the experience is like at MSG or at the Jazz or at the Cavs or the Timberwolves or the Rockets or anybody else, and so I empathize with the, with the challenges that they have and the visions for what they want to accomplish. We have to keep up the pace to deliver back to them so that they can execute those. Before we turn to audience questions, which we'll do in a, very shortly, I just want to ask you, Patrick, about an interesting concept you have, um, you're advocating for to a degree, called virtual tarping. And um, the background here is that only two college football bowl games sold out um, this year. And one of the solutions you're suggesting is that they basically throw a virtual tarp over the upper level of seats sell out the lower levels, and then open up that upper level. What, what reasoning um, is behind that? And um, also, do you worry about sort of, you know, uh, people saying, ah, artificial scarcity? Well, so I think looking at it from the lens of, you know, delivering a better, you know, value to the consumer earlier in the sales cycle, you know, for one, uh, you know, concentrating attendance really drives atmosphere. I mean, there, there's, there's no argument against that. When you have, you know, 18,000, you can put, I mean, the XFL, the Houston Roughnecks are a great example. They had 18,000 people in a 42,000 person venue, and it was way more raucous than uh, other games I've been to in the same venue that had 30,000 people, right? So that, that getting the atmosphere concentrated. Now, look, we understand there's, there's sponsorship concerns, and you kind of want to have a, a, a piecemeal or patchwork solution to kind of dressing the house, but we focus on the idea of, hey, look, if the cheapest ticket is going to be $25, why start with putting them in the upper level corner? If they're saying they want to go three months in advance, like, it's not that bad to give them a low row in the upper deck. And then as you sell those tickets, you open up more rows. But don't start with, you know, if, if you're playing in a 42,000 person venue and all your forecasts say that you're going to sell 30,000 tickets, why don't you sell the right 30,000 tickets first and then you can open up as demand increases? Uh, that's really the concept of, of, of virtual tarping and something that, you know, the software that we're building and the science that we're layering in is, is really focused on accomplishing because there's nothing worse than like, you know, you're sitting lower level midfield and there's all these empty seats except for a cluster in the upper level corner. You're confused. That feels weird. Or worse yet, you're that person in the upper level corner. And you're like, why are there all these empty rows ahead of me? So I think kind of like, you know, minimizing and eliminating that sort of disconnect uh, will really add to the atmosphere and add to the lifetime value of both the brand and the, and the fan experience. So a question from the audience, and I think this is directed to, to Kristen, but I'd open it up to everybody. It says, what can teams do in the ticketing space to help sell the in-stadium experience? It's a great question. Um, and, and this is this goes back to uh, the, our, our fan experience uh, staff, really understanding what our fans are looking for. Um, and a lot of times, you're not going to get that through surveying. We survey after every game to, to understand uh, what their experience was like. Uh, but the more that we can we can understand our fans from talking to the people who talk to our fans every day. Mm -hmm. uh, the more intelligence we can get back coming, you know, that's, that's not quantitative data, but qualitative, uh, to improve that experience, that's what we need to do more of. And Adam, I see a lot of head nodding. Yeah. Is this something that reflects your work with clients as well? <laughs> no, I mean, we work <laughs> with Madison Square Garden. I mean, it's, it's the more you know about your customers, the more you're going to tailor that experience. 
Um, and, and to your point, like surveying, a good survey results is what, 30% yep. usually? I mean, that's good. If, if that. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yep. And so you need to find all those different avenues you can to understand your fan base and understand who they are, what they want, what they like, um, so that you can, when they walk in, you get that attendance notification. Right show up with a blue moon beer and talk about the renewal or talk it's, about the new. The concierge approach is the exactly. way to go. You use the term and that's exactly what we've been talking about where fans really feel like you're there for them um, and really want to make their experience exceptional. Well, well, tell them what they have access to also. I mean, it's, you know. Oh I, God, the list of benefits drive me crazy. I, I mean, you know, part of the, I, I've, I've gone to games and I think I talked about this at this yeah. panel last year. I sat next, to, we, sat, we were sitting in an all-inclusive section and there were people next to me who did not know that the buffet and the bar was accessible to them with their ticket. They assumed they needed some other special pass until I said, hey, like, you know, this is available. So like the teams have got to like, you know, whether, send them an email, send them a text message, or have someone well-trained at the check-in to kind of just let them know what they have. You know, that's terrible if someone had that experience, they didn't know that they had all that, that access. I've always said that we in the ticket sales business are world-class athletes when it comes to selling our business. We know it inside and out. So I can describe to you, or you can describe every feature that your organization offers at the Garden. There is sometimes a, a little bit of a speed bump between what we then share with a customer. And so we assume that they know it, or we assume that they, uh, they, they, they know what to expect, where to go, to Patrick's point exactly. So uh, we want to continue to put more effort into and stop assuming all the time that our customers understand everything that they get with or the benefits of buying these tickets. Mm -hmm. Question here asks, can you speak to the idea of working with customers to utilize, it says it has banks with teams and it banks in quotes as a form of membership to give them custom access to different product offerings throughout a season. I think it's basically asking, how do you work with customers to, and fans in this case, to give them ac custom access to different product offerings throughout a season? Well, you, talk, you talked about it with Orlando. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that's the concept of the magic money or the jazz note. Um, tied in with you know, their mobile app and, and the loyalty program and being able to exchange those tickets. Right now it's you buy the tickets and then you can exchange them, but that's what I think teams are evaluating is saying, is it, are you actually buying the tickets or are you buying a you know, $60,000 investment and then you can allocate that and deploy that how you want to. So it's happening, those conversations are going on. Um, there's not a platform that's doing it really well right now. That it's just conceptual, but it's moving. We're, we're actually right? doing it now, okay. and, and, and you can actually uh, select different items, whether you want to get a photo on the court after the game. Um, we also have uh, bigger price items like All-Star Trip uh, that you can, you can use that bank towards. So we're, we're doing it now. Um, I'm probably going to do it even more. And we're seeing it a lot in Europe with loyalty point programs, and so you know, your investment gives you 10,000 points. And then you have a menu that you can take advantage of to be able to choose how it is you want to you want to enjoy your experience throughout the year. But I, I have the same want and need, like I said, with my NFL tickets. I have I, I don't want to have the same three seats every game. I want to have one game. I want to have six people. One game. I want to be in a, a community suite. And one game. I want to have three seats. So I'd, I'd rather to have that opportunity. That is is the trend, and that's where it's headed. And there's one other question here. What are the potential pros, cons of standing room only bar style ticketing options? Anyone have any thoughts on that? Well, well, the pro is that it's very easy to, to, to transact, right? So it's like, hey, I'll buy my ticket, you buy your ticket, we'll meet up there at 6.30. So I think that from that standpoint, uh, it, it's a great product. You know, I think that sometimes it's like, hey, what happens then when people really aren't paying attention yes. to the game? That's obviously a concern, but I think that ultimately it's like, get them in there because if someone isn't like drinking a beer at your bar inside your venue at 25 years old, there's a much less likely chance that they renew the suite when they become a 55 year old decision maker. Uh, so anything you can do to get them in the venue, I think you've really got to consider those options. Well, the Golden State Warriors, their last year at Oracle, decided that they were having such a great run with the seats and the stands that they were selling tickets that would get people into the building on game night and you wouldn't be able to see a second of the game. Uh, SoFi Stadium in LA, where the Rams and the Chargers are going to play, has an area that's dedicated to this communal so social experience, and you can't see the game from it. And you're not going to see the game from it, except on TVs, mm -hmm. but you're in the stadium and you're there with your friends. There, there, so that trend great, is growing. There's a great benefit to just saying, I was there. The, you know, the, this, I was there yep, you know, exactly. the other night, you know, Mika Zibanejad scored five goals, yeah. and I was able to say, I was yeah. there. And everybody else in the arena was able to say I was there. So the more that you allow people to say that and, and be able to put it on Instagram, the better. 
So I think this transitions nicely to the final question. We have a couple minutes left here. Um, what does the future of ticketing look like? You can, you can choose your time period, five years out, 10 years out, but crystal ball time here. And we'll just go right down the line, start with you, Rob. It is, it is what we've talked about today. It's no longer a piece of real estate. It is, it is experiential. Uh, you can, you know, an organization can do more, can have more. The other thing that we haven't talked about because it's not the topic today, but I, keep, I continue to see and I have a vision for, and we're not working on it right now, but gambling being tied into ticketing. When you go to buy a ticket, placing a bet on the sporting event you're gonna go see as a way to start that interaction. So there are a number of things, but it is about eliminating the ticket and the barcode as we know it now, and more about you as a user. You become the ticket, you become your credit card, and you're, you're, you're being personalized and being in the building, you have the chance to drive your, your experience without ever having to pull your phone out or to have a piece of paper with you. Yeah, I, along those lines, there won't be a ticket. It will be identity-based coming in. I mean, you're already seeing it with the airline industry. I fly Delta, I fly a lot. Um, I don't even use a ticket now. Like, you go through ATL and it's uh, uh, face recognition uh, sometimes now going in. So it's going to go away. It's all going to be personal identity coming in, knowing who that person is coming through the gates, um, which will ultimately, I think, provide a better experience, right? Uh, because right now, teams know maybe half of who's in the arena, probably less, right? Because yep. um, I'm bringing my four friends with me on my tickets. Um, and so making it more personalized through biometrics and those types of things. You kind of look at ticket being the, the front door to the relationship with our fans. And the more that we know about our fans and know who's in our building, the, deep, the more that we can deepen those relationships. And it kind of, everything tends to go uh, innovate and, and, and there's a progression, but there's always that reversion back of what do people really want? They want us to know them. They want us to have a real relationship with them. Uh, so LeBron James, uh, his son, Bronny James, uh, his fifth year in the league, he's going to send out a message to fans on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook all at the same time, encouraging them to come to the game. You're going to press one click to decide what ticket you want, and then that's going to be part of his compensation. So I think that that's going to be a uh, part of the future. Wow. And on that note, I'd like to thank our panelists, Rob, Adam, Kristen, and Patrick, and thank you all for coming. Um, and that does it for this ticketing panel.